Good morning, Goeiemorgen, Dumelang. Uh, welcome to this, our second session of this year's Nation in Conversation series. We've just had a blasting first uh, series on the economy. Um, first time is coming to Nampo and uh, really blowing off the heads. Um, that was interesting to see how we see the uh, uh, Nampo sector. Uh, 12 years and still going. Um, the last two years, of course, we couldn't have the series. Uh, but what we've uh, managed with the Nation in Conversation to make Agri and the Agri value chains part of the national conversation. No use us talking to each other. We should inform the end user because that is what we do. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the, the social compact that is developing in the South African economy because of the incompetence of uh, governments. And I think um, it's, it is something that we let slip out of our hands and we should take that back. Communities should fend for themselves because we can do it better. Um, private sector and the economy can do it better. I think it's an important theme that you'll see pulled through. The second session on chemicals, uh, hugely topical international demand from uh, consumers. And uh, Theo, I really look forward to uh, this session and your esteemed panel. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, and thank you for each one of you attending. Um, please, there's uh, sessions tomorrow. There's a very interesting session on logistics, very topical issue. Please come and join us uh, tomorrow. Yet the course. <laughs> it was produced for you. <laughs> Have it. Uh, enjoy it. Thank you. We're going to watch a short video just to give some background uh, to our discussion. So, so it, uh, it's a few minutes long, so the video will play in the next minute or two. Pesticides, regardless of their origin, have one common characteristic, and that is to manage undesired organisms. This characteristic is often feared by the uninformed and sometimes used as a lobbying tool against certain pesticides. Understanding the difference between hazard and risk is perhaps the most valuable tool to allay the public's fears of pesticides, but also to instill a sense of responsibility in the people who use agricultural chemicals. The use of biochemicals uh, in agriculture is becoming very controversial. We have seen major emphasis on uh, lowering of carbon footprints and lowering the use of biochemicals such as pesticides, herbicides in agriculture. There's a huge shift towards regenerative practices and it's important that uh, farmers in South Africa also take note of this because we need to protect our natural resources uh, for the next generation and we must make sure that our water and our land resources are maintained and kept in a pristine condition. The difference between hazard and risk is that hazard refers to the possibility of something causing harm, while risk is the probability of harm occurring. The issue of pesticides in the South African context, as well as the regulation thereof, is based on a risk approach and not a hazard approach, as is the trend in some other countries. Although a pesticide is categorized as hazardous, it does not mean its use should be banned. If it has been proven safe in local assessments and does not pose a non-manageable risk to human health and the environment, then farmers should be able to use the products to effectively manage pests. In South Africa, we're very fortunate to have a very rigorous um, registration process which uh, makes the use of our agrochemicals uh, safe if we use it according to the label and um, it helps us to be sustainable in the grain and oilseed industry. The irresponsible use as well as the unlawful acquisition, incorrect disposal or sale of an agricultural chemical for a purpose other than that specified on the label is illegal under the relevant legislation. As the saying goes, the right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second session of today and the second session of this series of Nation in Conversation. Um, we have a very important uh, topic to discuss, and I think that the video set the scene as to the complexities in this. And, and what, are, what we are going to try to address is the responsible use of chemicals, balanced against environmental, friendly, green, uh, our environment, but with a key element of making sure that farmers stay um, commercially viable, that they can produce food that are um, predictable, that are healthy, um, and that are available. So these are major factors that need to be balanced. I'm, I'm, I'm privileged enough that the panel consists of two people that are involved in the production of food, farmers, and I'll get to Jaco and Egon just now, and then two people, um, Kubus and Klaus, that are in the industry side, that are leading, leading lights in, in, in where the industry is going. So let me first introduce the panel to you. Dr. Klaus Ekstein, he's the CEO of Bayer South Africa. Klaus, welcome. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Jaku Minar next to him, and Jaku is not here as president of Agri-SA today. He's here as a farmer, a successful farmer in Hennemann. So, um, Jaku, welcome. Look forward to your contribution. Thank you. E thank you. Egon Zunkel, he's a director also of Zunkel Farms. Egon, welcome. Thank you very much. Egon and Jaku are the two producers who work with us daily. And Kobus Meinkis, he's the president of Crop Life South Africa. Kobus, welcome. Thank you. Klaus, let me start with you. This debate is an international debate. Just give us your perspective, opening remarks on the topic. For us, the, the fundamental part is um, understanding farming. And as a company, we're looking into shaping agriculture and shaping the future of farming, benefiting, of course, the farmer, but also the consumer and our planet. So from the beginning, we're not only talking about a product, we're talking the impact of a product on an environment, on a population, on food. And it is co the combination, of course, not only of a single product, it's a combination of variable topics such as, from our point of view, seeds, crop protection, and digital that together really allow us to be much more specific in addressing the needs of, on the one hand side, profitable farming, because without going back onto the fundaments of farming, we will not be able to be successful in the future but profitability and sustainability needs to be an absolute balance to each other. And here we are, of course, putting a lot of money in two areas. And one is, of course, in the development of new technology. And we saw a lot of you know, pests here. We saw diseases, but we also see beneficials. And in our testing research, we're really looking at what is a new compound doing on, on bees, on ladybirds, on soil microdegradation. Everything needs to be known because this is what we do to be committed towards the future. And on the other side, what is in the market is to be stewardship. And we heard it just now to really see we have developed label ba based on sound science. And this is what we need to make sure that these products reach the crop at the right stage and address to what they're designed for, to, to fight the pest, the disease, or a weed, to increase then, of course, the sustainability of food production for a growing world population. And, and it's a balance. But you need That's to that analyze balance. every. You need That's to that balance. Analyze and understand every element of that balance. Correct, and bring it back, of course, to a farming mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Because at the end, the farmer knows how that farm looks like, how that environment looks like, and then start really putting it down on a lot of information, mm -hmm. and starting to sequence. You know, how can we bring more information to know every square <coughs> meter of the farm, and then to produce more with less? Mm -hmm. Because that's again going back to the principle of sustainability and, and profitability. That, that's the margin. Correct. That's yeah. the margin. Margin not to the, to, the, to the detriment of sustainability because if you want to want, want a farm, you don't want to farm today. Yeah. You do an investment over generations. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want to, like in mining, you, you find it quite often where people will almost strip all the valuable assets off the mine and three, four years down the line, there's no mine. And that's certainly not the aim. Yeah. Yaku, as a producer, how do you approach this challenge between using um, uh, responsible using of chemicals, um, looking after the long-term sustainability of your farm, a key element is but remain profitable. How do you balance these? I think for, for a farmer, it's very important 
Um, chemicals, like they said in the intro, is, is poisonous if you use too much. Um, but if you use it in balance, um, that's something that can really be beneficial. And that's the way we look at it as, as, as farmers. I'm the third generation farmer on, on, on the soil, and, and my son wants to farm as well, and I believe his kids will farm will farm as well one day. So our vision isn't simply a five or ten year vision. We, we've got a 50, 60, 80 year vision um, on the farm. And in terms of that, we want to protect what we have as well. We want to look after it as, as, as good as possible. Our first aim in, in using um, chemicals on the farm is, is just to the, protect the crop, to be more efficient and to get a good quality um, safe food for, for, for the consumer at the end of the day on the table, but as well protect protect our environment, the nature that we live in, and, as, and our workers working, work, working with it. So that's our view in, in, in working with chemicals and using, using chemicals. But all, also the stewardship of, of that chemical, using it in the right way at the right time. And I think for us as farmers that's very important that we protect that, but, but we, can't, we can't really use a go without it. Um, we've got weeds. Um, some of the wheat, uh, wheat, wheat, wheat uh, seeds last for up to 80 years in the soil. So you can't say, for the past five years I've controlled my wheat, there will be no more weeds. It, it's a continuous process. There's continuous um, new things developing, coming into your farm developing, and you have to react to that. Um, and, and sometimes you can react in a biological way, sometimes you need to uh, react in a chemical way. In the end, what, what I gather from that is you need to react but because there's generations to come, you also have to keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. Egon, your approach? It's much the same as uh, Yaku. We, we stewards of the soil. I see myself as a steward of a kingdom business because the creator, God, made the earth to be sustainable. And if we talk sustainability, I found myself in a situation, was it did I see the light or did I feel the heat? Um, you can't sustain a... a broken system. So that's where the regenerative agriculture caught my attention. We've been no tilling for 28 years now and included cover crops as a soil health principle for about eight years now. It's doing well against all odds. And so with that, uh, we've been careful to not get into that, what I heard coined as the, the vortex to hell and become a moron. You've got to keep putting more on. And so we've tried to get past the sustainability and get to regenerative. And so we've seen results in the first 10 years of just zero tillage on its own. We doubled the carbon in our soil. And everybody knows it's a bigger bucket that you can, <coughs> if you had a pot plant, it's a bigger pot. And so we've seen the results thereof. And over the years, we've been able to reduce our fertilizer and we're also trying to reduce the chemical. I agree we can't take everything away because uh, life happens and there's the bank manager as well. You've got to farm to live for the generations to come. So we just see ourselves as responsible stewards of God's creation. Thank you. Kobus, uh, your initial take on, on what's been discussed? I think from a crop life perspective, Firstly, we need to understand it's a voluntary organization. So all the members are voluntarily part of CropLife, but we encourage all of, the, uh, all of our partners in the industry to become part of CropLife, where we can really try to regulate and set certain standards of how products are used. Like we said, there's a risk and a hazard. Um, when we look at crop protection, somebody once told me that I think alcohol is a as a class A1 carcinogen. I think all of us enjoy a, a, a glass of wine every now and again, but it's how do we use that? And, and this is where we want to teach, where we want to educate and create that forum and the platform where we can really uplift the whole industry. So I think that's the role that CropLife can play, where we can be custodians of the products and also facilitate, I think, the process of getting products registered. I think. The important part is that there is a good system currently in the country to, uh, to register new products. Unfortunately, there are some time delays that we are experiencing because of capacity issues. And this is where CropLife can once again represent the industry with government to say, how can we speed up this process? Because the only way that we can bring new products 
that might have a different profile, might have a safer profile, is to get them registered, and therefore we need the government um, support on that. So from a crop life perspective, really trying to improve the level. We've got our CPD programs that are running to improve the level of the agents and everybody that participate in the industry to make sure that we are good stewards of the products and that we can manage the risk. Because we know this product that has, has it, that can be hazardous, but as long as we can manage the risk and have the right people there to manage the risk, that enables us to use that product safely. And, and that comes back to responsibility. <coughs> well, sure. I think everybody that is part of that industry organization, we've signed a almost like a pact uh, that, that we, how will we act towards uh, growers, how do we act towards the environment to ensure we can manage the risk and make sure that we're, we're all there for the long run. If a farmer is not sustainable, we don't have any business in the future. So that, and that is part of that. If the farmer cannot farm because of the way that we've used the pesticide, we don't have a business in the future. Klaus, I want to ask, take this, this discussion slightly on a different route for, for, for a few minutes. Is part of that a perception problem? Is it an education problem in terms of the consumer? Or uh, where does that, why is there so, so differing perceptions as to the role of the different players? Um, I think you got a very important point. Um, it is, of course, a topic where consumers say, look, I don't want any poison on my food. Correct. So this is a bluntly yeah. a blunt statement that With many the consumers strong words in it. Correct. That many consumers go back to. The question is, what are we talking today in a healthy food production system? Because everything falls back to chemistry. Whether you have a fungi growing on your apple or you don't have a fungi growing on your apple. Correct. You need to understand what is on that food and what we're having today. We're working integrated production systems where we selectively use the input factors to optimize productivity and don't take you know, an, 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 a trade-off on sustainability, we're today producing the most healthy food that we ever did before. Yeah? The question is that we have as a, as, a, as a world is, the world is growing, do we have affordable food for a growing world population? And it not only starts in the world, it starts in Africa with 1.3 billion people. And I think it needs to go back to actually understanding that, to what Kulbis said just now, we, we're really caring for applying crop protection products in a way that it's designed for. Because it's designed for, for having a residue. But that residue has been tested and it's been found safe for human consumption. So I'll just give you an example of maybe an apple, correct? So if you buy a, a modern product with a, with a residue that's alike, you need to eat 200 tons for three months of apple a day in order to get impacted by this. On the other side, if you eat two or three cups of apple kernels, you get killed. Correct. It's just putting into perspective. Well, what's the risk? Where what the risk is the risk is? that you that you're running? But to put it into a mother or into a father and into a kid it requires a different discussion. You don't need to have a science approach. You need to talk about sustainable approaches. Of we spoke about the topic of carbon today. How do you sustainably reinvest into the soil? How do you measure this? How do you make it part of a business in farming? Because today, a, a, a ton of carbon is a lot of money. You can sell it on the market if you do it and you measure it properly. So I think it's translating um, the technology we have also into the mindset of a consumer and really start talking about what does it impact our world. And I think that's the discussion one needs to have. It starts with crop protection, but it ends up with sustainable farming and producing affordable food for the growing world population. But, but it also, your, your, your apple example, um, that's the kind of... Um, uh, numbers that you don't get in the, in the popular media. You will get apples is poisonous. The fact that you have to, to, to overindulge to such extent, um, it, it's that, that message gets, get, gets, gets used by people with different agendas. Is that not the case? So, I mean, the, the point is a complex topic. Yeah. You know, and to translate a complex topic is an easy, an easy language. That's something we need to yeah. do more often mm. and do better. Mm. And um, of course, that needs to highlight also maybe in discussions with consumers, because you should not step away of it. And we as a company basically opening this up in terms of you know, asking the, 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 the population also, what questions do you have? How can we address them? Because we're caring not only for the consumers, but we're caring for the environment. We're, taking, we're caring for you know, the biotopes that are out there. And, and if you speak, for example, for, the, for the, the, the new generation crop protection products that have reached us over the last 10 years and will in the next 15 to 20 years, you will see that they're very, very specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very specific. I mean, um, we, we just uh, um, spoke about the integration of chemical and biologics. Neither 
of both is a unique solution. But both of them together in an integrated production system has a lot of value. But for this, you need to know what's happening on your farm, what's happening in your orchard, and to understand that microcosm. And I think this is where data in future will help us a lot to get more accurate, smaller down to a square meter, and actually manage more sustainable in future. But what we're doing today, if we develop and use our technology and our science properly, is of course the topic of how do we translate this into people, into advice, yeah. into stewardshiping it. And I think this is where we, of course, work together with, with you know, organizations yeah. like CropLife to stewardship the farm at the end of the day, mm -hmm. because it needs to happen on the farm. And, and going back onto the topic of how do we provide a future for sustainable food production? Yeah. Uh, Egon uh, Yaku talked quite a bit about changing the way he farmed. Uh, in the last 28 years and 10 years, the way he farmed. Your, in terms of your farming operations, have, have you adapted to some of these elements and, and how do you approach adapting and changing ways uh, uh, on a farm with a premise that it needs to be a generational asset? I think um, the, 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 the long term of it, um, in terms of what we use, the, the chemicals that we used in the past to you, um, Today's chemicals is much more safe than it was in the past. So we, we you, and you agree with the point that the food is a lot more healthier now than ever before? For sure, for sure. Um, the, the way that we, we use less chemicals, we've got the, the GMOs available now, which makes us use less chemicals as well. So there's a whole process of, of, of using less, being more, more timely and more specific in, in our application to have the impact later. Um, we see it specifically in, 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 in a lot of crops, but specifically in maize. When you spray a certain pesticide, it has an impact for, for one or two months, which creates other pests to come into your maize as well. So now we differ in, time, in terms of our timing <coughs> and of what products we use, that it's more specific and, not, and, and less general. And I think that's, that's constantly developing. Um, it's developing in South Africa, but it's developing all, all over the world. And I think that makes us use, if, if I look at my, my farm, the amount of, of pesticides that I used 10 or 15 years ago, it's a lot less, less now. We also now start, start seeing the impact it has on the soil as well, or it had in the past on the soil, um, and like Egon, Egon said in, in terms of regenerative, um, we, we want to use less, less residue, shorter periods, um, but, but more effective. And I think if we can get to a point where, 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 where we can keep every year just a little bit more effective, more effective, at the end of the day, we, we will be happy that we can control everything that we, we can control without any risk um, for, for, for any of the consumers. Egon, your point of view, you made some major changes. <coughs> what led you, and, 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 and how would you recommend those changes to other farmers? Dear, it was one of those where I felt the heat and saw the light a bit later. Uh, it started with compaction and, and soil crusting, really. The bare soil temperatures of, and we physically measured them, of 20 degrees difference in temperature of a bare soil to a covered soil, and that's on a spring day. So you want to talk global warming, that's another whole subject. For us, it was about capping and runoff and experiencing drought conditions under irrigation, where after a thunderstorm or a few irrigations, the soil would just cap and water would run off. So we, with a bit of motivation from some reps and that, we had to do something. And so we got into the conservation tillage. And of course, you open yourself up to learning about what you're doing. And then we got into the no-till after four years of conservation tillage. We got into the no-till and from the word go, we were successful. And then you realized after 14 years, there's a problem here. It's not sustainable on its own. It scratched our heads again. Beware revenge tillage, I was taught. So we had to find a biological answer to this, and we started growing cover crops. And we sorted out a host of problems, including nematodes and, and uh, fusarium root rot and stuff, where crop under center pivot gave us seven tons a hectare, and the drylands around the side gave us eight and a half tons per hectare. We got thinking very quickly, and uh, we just remedied that for the sake of time with one crop of oats. It sorted out that problem. So just to stick to the subject, it has been a walk of how did God create the earth to function normally? If there's a problem, it's because we've messed it up somehow. 
and that's based on many years of experience touring and talking to groups and attending NOTO type of conferences. Um, sitting on a ski lift in the United States next to a, what I classed as a fairly learned fella, and we discovered we're farmers and we got farm chatting, and he says, isn't it terrible, all these poisons? And I go, yeah. And he was on about the GMOs. Well, it means that in the early days, we used to have to hold a flag to get the aircraft to spray. And I realized I wouldn't like to do this all my life, and um, our staff as, as well, of course. And so by going that route, we used less chemicals, as Yako has already alluded to. So it's been a, a slow growth, but we're continually growing and really farming to emulate nature. I think that's the punchline. Gubis, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of lead the next question. In terms of technology and developments, uh, what, is the, what are you expecting or what are you seeing coming into the market as we speak? And where are the are they, are they emphasis moving towards? The emphasis is definitely moving to more safer products. All of the companies that are part of our organization, it's not only the traditional crop protection uh, and synthetic products. We've got biological companies that's part of our organization as well. And we even see the multinational traditional synthetic uh, <coughs> crop protection companies also investing in more biological kind of uh, products, uh, products that have a b different profile. I think when we look at the future, we look at where, what will be the regulations, how will we measure in the future, because companies are investing quite a lot when they have to develop those new technologies. So we need to be able to have that technology sustainably in the market to recover the cost. So there's definitely a move to products that are more targeted. I think like Klaus said earlier, not broad spectrum, so that we can use them more targetedly. And then there's other technologies that's also developing, you know, using data, uh, using analysis, uh, detection, all of these things in terms of uh, trapping, in terms of uh, herbicides, detecting and spot spraying. So there's a lot of technology that's being developed, but obviously all of these technologies cost money. So th Someone's got to fund the R&D. Somebody, somebody's got to pick up the bill, and the, and the bill is quite large when it comes to R&D in this environment. So the, we, we see in crop life more and more of these companies coming onto the foreground and registering new products and, and bringing new solutions to growers. So I think that is the most important thing. We need to integrate what we have. I mean, there's different tools available. Not one is a silver bullet, but how do we integrate the different tools to provide the right solution to the grower? At the I'm going to stock. Yeah, I want to class. I want to come to you specifically because you noted the subject. <clears throat> Somebody once said at the conference that the only thing that a wheat cannot do is grow in a straight line. Apart from that, it can do everything. But class, <laughs> class, from your point of view, you talked about development, about. Um, uh, creating product, technologies, ways of doing business, and you talked about the three pillars of the business. Let's talk a bit about where's the current trends in terms of technology and what can we expect in the next few years coming through um, into, the, into the farming operations? But it's a, it's a very important question, and as Kuba said, it costs a lot of money. Yeah, I understand. So, where, Money and time. Where we, that's, I was just coming to the time, correct? So you might have a brilliant new technology that's specific maybe to, to one pathogen, to one disease or one pest, but suddenly it shows a spike on the toxicity. It just gets taken off. So, and this can go four or five years already into development. Mm. A new crop protection, crop protection product takes about seven to nine years of development mm. and costs you about between three to 700 million euro to develop, correct? So, and this is... The, the challenge is how do you translate modern technology into it? And I mean, 10, 15 years ago, it took us a computer the size of this room and probably months to, to, to understand, a, a, you know, a, a germplasm of, of an individual, of a, of, of a plant or of a, of, a, of, a, of a fungi or whatever. Today we can do it in one and a half minute. So it's really to understand where is, you know, where is the specific mode uh, in, a, in a pest, in a disease, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a fungi, which you can address, which you can put a chemistry on. So it's not a selection process, it's a design um, topic. And we're doing design now, not only in crop protection product, but we do it also in our seeds, correct? We're starting to understand germplasm 
translating the germplasm to environments because it needs to be in South Africa on a specific environment and then start developing this A from a, from a seeds perspective or trades perspective or on a crop protection perspective. So it's more specific to then go also into a cascade where you can be absolutely sure that this compound really makes all the bills from a human toxicity, from an you know, environmental point of view, from a beneficial point of view, all these checks and balance, groundwater, everything that you need to check to get it deregulated in a market that is global. You know, where at the end, in EU, or US, and Australia, and South Africa, Everybody we look over and say, sign. this is safe. You know, and this is benefiting the farmer because it needs to bring innovation. <coughs> now the question, of course, is these are specific products that need specific requirements. You need to basically put them in specific slots, like Jaco said, on the farms. So you need to know what you're doing and measure it and protect these compounds because they need to deliver in a market as well. If you don't know what you do, you can lose these compounds because of you know, resistance development. So start alternating what you do. Understand, work with beneficials to actually get your threshold, threshold level down and, and work in harmony with nature. Yeah, so that is, at the end, to stewardship the own investment that we do. That's why we saw, um, you know, after the stewardship. Because it's not, I mean, a new herbicide mode of action covers, you might know that, probably takes us 20 years, 25 years to bring out a new mode of action. This is, this is unique. And you need to safeguard it for 25 years. So that's why it's so important that on the one side is looking into new technologies where innovation brings value to the farmer without you know, jeopardizing your environment, but on the other side also stewardship in the way that it provides value over time. How do you think that is going to... The, first of all, I assume that in the last 10, 20 years it's become even more onerous to bring more product onto the market simply because of the requirements has been enhanced and the focus has shifted. Is that a, is that a fair comment? Um, you can say it's a fair comment, but it's not viable. You know, the, the times where you could put out three to four new modes of action every three years, either insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides, it's, it's over. You know, you, because of the, the, the challenge on the regulations that you get put onto, that, that becomes very narrow. So the trade-off of this is actually start working on, on, on digital tools. You know, how do you, understand, how do you understand where is that wheat growing on this farm? So I only want to spray where that wheat is growing. I and don't want to spray, spray the, the rest area. of the area. So a digital um, sensor can tell you that, you know, and starting really to, that's why I use the word farm more with less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really to understand how do you, how do you relate, relate this? Because on the one hand side, it is expensive to develop. It is very specific and it's costly to a farmer. So at the end, if you bring that new technology and it costs him double or triple the price, he will say, I'm not going to use this. Mm -hmm. But if we can say we're digitalizing it and laying an, an overlay in terms of where's your pest happening in your orchard or your diseases or your weeds, focus on this because this is where an impact can happen. You're suddenly focusing maybe on 5 or 10% of your field and not on the entire field. And suddenly you're becoming much more specific in what you do in safeguarding, but using that technology also from an integrated point of view. And I'm not saying... This is only a, a solution of digital you know, seeds, traits, and crop protection. It is, is the combination of farming, because you're starting with fertilizers, with organic content of soil, with all these things to really talk about fer fer fertility of soil to make your plant robust and strong. But on the other side, you're having a cornfield or a maize field and a soybean field. This is food for somebody. Yeah, and this is why diversity is so important, your crop rotation. And we're having just a discussion this morning about maize and soybeans coming into South Africa more popular because it, it, it just brings a better benefit from a crop rotation point of view. Yaku, from your point of view, how do you see changing in the future? Uh, approach for, specifically <coughs> from a farmer application point of view. I think the effectiveness, as, as Klaus alluded to, the, the the amount of data you, that you get available, you can you can be more precise in terms of application. We we start start using drones because they're more effective than 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 the high boys, the the, the, the bigger sprayers that we used in the past. And there's certain areas where we we, we, we we use variable rate applications in certain parts of the fields. There's more weed pressure, so we already are starting using that. I think with a new technology, with camera technology, identifying specific weeds and you. 
spray specific chemicals and specific onto that wheat. specific wheat. Uh, that, that's something that we're really looking forward to because that's going to save you a lot of cost as well and going to be a lot safer. So it's 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 developing in terms of technology. I think the stewardship, uh, making sure that you can apply when you want to apply at the right time, um, that's becoming more important. It's a management thing. Um, the, the concern that we are, are ever have, um, the, 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 the act that's controlling this whole chemical um, is an act from 1947. Um, so if you just think 1947... Would Before they, white decay. For sure. <laughs> would, would they have... I've seen that technology, the, the developments, the data that we have available, and I think that's something that we need to address well, uh, as well. We see it in the, in the fruit industry specifically. Certain chemicals that's banned in Europe where our fruit goes um, is, 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 is still being used in South Africa, um, but the new technology that they can use in Europe isn't available in South Africa because it takes four or five years for the registrar just to register that specific chemical in South Africa. Mm. So that's something that we really re need to address and re to need to address faster in order to use that technology and be accepted in South Africa faster. We as South African farmers are very um, good um, uh, acceptors of, of new technology. We, we, we use it very fast in order to be, to be more effective and, and more competitive in terms of a global market. So we need to get that technology to be competitive, but also to be safer. Mm. Just in the previous discussion, Dr. Ferdi Meyer was one of the guests, and he alluded to that in the agriculture master plan, those things are highlighted mm. as things that need to be addressed. Uh, if you want to remain competitive internationally. I'm quickly going to go to Kubus before I get back to Egon. Kubus, if you look at what we talked about now, the, 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 what Yaku and Klaus referred to, the fact that we, there, there'll be a lot more precise utilization of these things, and um, we talked about drones, we talked about specific applications to a specific weed. If you look at that, how do you see the next three to four years? Is that the way, are we going to start that, or is that still 10 or 15 years away? I think it depends on some of the technologies. It's probably three to four years away. Uh, for some of it, it will be a little bit later on. But for me, a very important part, and this is where crop life can also play a role, is how do we manage the image of the business and the, the image with the consumer out there today? Because the, the, the image of the consumer, <coughs> if, you, if you listen to what everybody's saying here, the farmers, how they want to use products uh, responsibly how they want to use less product on their farm. I'm sure they don't wake up in the morning to say, hey, I can go and spray something today. They want to spray as little as possible. They want to you know, be as responsible as possible. In the same voice, we hear the crop protection companies talking about how they want to be more responsible. So I think that's where crop life can play an important role. Because we're we're a voluntary association, but we're not selling anything to anybody. We're, we're more independent, and this is the important part. How do we get that message out to the consumer? How do consumers, how can we build a trust with consumers so that they also understand the bigger picture and not just sensation around certain products, but rather understand what is the technology, what is the investment, what is the research that goes behind all of this, and that everybody in this whole ecosystem is really trying to manage that to the best of our abilities um, and doing it profitably for a grower at the end of the day. So how do we manage that that image? And I think that's where crop life is trying to play an important role. You know, we've we've taken on things like container management, where how do we manage containers? How do we use that plastic and recycle that plastic? There's now industry regulations that is coming in now for the whole plastic industry, but crop life had an initiative and the industry had an initiative even before that. We, when when the when the regulations came in from government, crop life already had their whole process in place. So I think that is kind of the image and the message that we also want to get and out of the And you talk part. about the whole industry now. The whole industry. So that is where crop life plays a role in pulling the whole industry together and saying how can we educate also the consumer out there about what is being done to make sure products are being used uh, responsibly. Companies that are involved in our industry, whether it's a manufacturer, whether it's a distributor, that we have people out there that are responsible and using this in a safe manner. And how can we get that image out to the and, and that message out? Because I think that's a message that's not often uh, going out to the public and, and that they're not aware of that. Klaus? Yeah, um, we're really speaking about creating public opinion. Yeah. 
And I think we need to make it bigger than South Africa. I mean, South Africa is an export country of, of citrus, of grapes, of nuts. And, and, and we're exporting into markets like the EU. Um, we, on the other side, speak about GMOs in South Africa. We need to have, on the one hand side, our own dialogue, because we need technology in Africa that is not required in Europe. If you speak about fall armyworm, that pest that's really impacting 60% of yields in Africa at the moment, it's not available in Europe. So the technology that's required to actually, mm. you know, sustain uh, um, healthy and, 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 and affordable food supply, it's a different discussion. And I think there's, there's discussions happening in the EU with the EU Green Deal, for example, that will exclude Africa. And we need to bring this topic to the forefront that Africa needs technology to actually drive their own agenda. And this is, of course, about the topic that Kubis mentioned about educating, about you know, driving policy, but on the other side also addressing the bottleneck that we have here to bring innovation into South Africa to keep agriculture competitive from a sustainable and a profitable point of view because the world is not stopping. But it no. will get more, more expensive to import food from outside into South Africa we cannot produce ourselves. It certainly will make a massive difference. Yeah. And then you, only, then you have to then also look at the challenges, as you said, in Africa, yeah. where there's massive uh, yield gaps and, uh, uh, and sustainability issues, which, which has got a different solution than, than, than Europe or North America. Yeah, I mean, matter. asking a smallholder farmer in Africa, I cannot give you a technology that you can actually uh, use to improve your lives, your livelihood, um, your food supply. Mm and making your community more competitive and growing because of you know, a regulation that's maybe set up in a different part. I think it requires a good discussion yeah. and, and getting stakeholders around that table to actually talk about it, to actually drive that policy as well from, and, from and an it, African it, perspective. And it comes down to proper evidence and proper education, not just so that you move away from slogans, right. but you get to it proper. Right. Um, I see we've got about 14 minutes left, so I'm going to ask before we take questions, everybody, for a closing comment, not more than a comment, a closing uh, uh, discussion, specifically from an advice point of view. So this is now advice more for the, for the, for the farmer, the producer, but also advice in terms of this whole question. And I'm going to start, Egon, with you. If you were to provide advice, and in your case it's very much to your the, 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 your, the farmer community, the bigger farmer community. What is your advice? You know, I'll be frank and say it's a body, mind and spirit thing. So that's been my walk. Uh, I had somebody from totally outside say to me, your farming turned around when you became religious. It wasn't about being religious and doing certain rituals, but it was a relationship with the Creator and therefore starting to understand how creation works. Like I said, all the problems we've experienced is because we've messed up what was created perfect. So my advice would be, have a look at nature. Einstein, to quote him, he said, look deep into nature. And uh, in the Bible, there's lots of quotes about observe nature. Ask the animals, Job, I mean, I don't want to go into a a biblical lesson now, but it's all there. And if we've got to work, as people want to call it, mother nature, we've got to find out how she functions, how nature functions, how the earth functions, and work with it. There's a, a bit of a humorous thing I want to quote Scott Goneman in the States. He says, beware mother nature, she can turn around and kick you in the crotch. <laughs> and it does. When you mess with mother nature or you mess with God's creation, you're going to come second. So we had capping, we had erosion, this global warming thing as well, as far as we've physically measured bare soil to be 20 degrees hotter. So my advice would be, you've got to get it into your heart. It's not all about head knowledge, but deciding that you're going to make a difference. Before you feel the heat, try and see the light. Gubas, your advice to, um, to farmers, to the community out there in terms of this topic? The most important part for me is that we spread the good message, that farmers also help us to spread the message of how important the products that they are using today are for them and, and in sustainable growing of food. That is an important part for us. And then also for them to support the industry the, in the sense of using people that are crop life members. We really support 
the, the, or ask them to support those members because within the crop life organization we can manage how we educate, we can manage how we train people, we can manage how the quality of the industry and the quality of the people in the industry are improved. So it's really important for us that when you use uh, crop protection or when you use seeds, use people that are part of the organization that helps us to make sure that the, the advice that you're going to get is from a qualified uh, person and, and that helps us to improve the level and the image of, the, of our industry. And I think that is really important for us um, with the consumers. Jakub, you're also a, uh, a producer um, and you specifically uh, represent a producer. What is your advice? I think firstly, um, be, be responsible in your stewardship. Make sure that whatever you use is, is, is within the confines, within the research. Um, and, I, and I think um, to, to, to go to a way where you can regenerate, as Egon has said, but in a responsible way as well. We, we, we're also responsible to securing um, food in, in, in the whole world. And, and within that, we need to produce as mo most effective as we can. If, if, if it's using chemicals, if it's using cover crop, if it's using regenerative farming, that is the best way you can do. But every soil depends um, as, as different factors that, that's got an influence on that. I think as consumers as well, we would all like to eat organic food. Um, but if you walk into Woolies and you see the price difference between organic and, 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 and normally produced food, um, they, then you probably would go um, depending on your budget, but, but for the cheaper food. And I think where we live in Africa, it's, it's that balance between the two. Yes, we can all produce organic, we're going to produce less, less food, and it's going to be more expensive. Can we do that to the hungry people in, in, and, and the poor people around the world? No, we simply can't. So we need to find the balance between the, 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 the two, and we need to decide where do we want to fit, fit in terms of that. Klaus, from your point of view, um yeah, advice? I would have probably two or three messages. One is, of course, um, we have seen in the last two or three years on, and probably longer that agriculture needs to be a key topic for us in South Africa. Yeah. And this is not only from a transformation point of view, but most important to also for the, for the general awareness that we need to do something to sustain the production of healthy food in our country. And saying this, we need to honor what the farmers are doing, small or big. In our country, they're in a very harsh environment. And how they do farm, I think, reserves a lot of recognition. But also um, a lot of recognition on the transformation that's going to come upon farming, because the world is just getting smaller. For the youth, I would say, um, please, find agriculture sexy and, and interest yourself for agriculture, because it's a beautiful area to, to learn technology, to learn digital, and to, to apply it back on something that you can immediately feel an impact and really feeds the world. So it's something that's very rewarding. And for ourselves, I think it's continue these partnerships and an open discussion where you know the technology we bring in the market gets used in a way that it's used uh, on the one hand side to, of course, um, sustain profitable farming but doesn't jeopardize sustainability. It's continue that open discussion to be transparent and, and, and re really not only drive the, the success of what we do in, in a sustainable way but also drive our public opinion and, of course, policies from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to give a hand to my panel, Kubis, Egon, Yaku, Klaus. Thank you very much. So let's take, uh, there is a roving mic. I am going to take a few questions. Um, so I'm going to take the question. So please um, address the question to who you want to and also what you, um, uh, who you are, just so that we can talk to you directly on answering the question. Any hands? There's one question there, the lady in, in pink. Yes. Thank you very much. It's been a very insightful um, panel discussion. Thank you very much. I think it's an, it's an open question to the panel. Um, something that we've not discussed is I think a lot of controversy in the media now with insect populations declining. And we acknowledge the importance in terms of you know, the micro and the macro landscape. And my question would be, should there, are we doing enough currently in terms of the decline in the insect population, should there not be an extended producer responsibility or initiative specifically from a chemical manufacturing companies or pesticides manufacturing companies and farming, for instance, rewilding, you know, to actually address that kind of problem that we're sitting with now. 
Um, I'm an ecological engineer by profession, so, and my name is Yolandi Skuman, so that's why I'm asking that. Thank Thanks, you. Yolandi. Any other questions? Any other question? All right, thank you very much, Yulandi. Um, that question is, uh, she said to the panel, I think um, perhaps uh, Klaus and Kubis is probably better positioned than uh, Egon. So let's start with Egon, your comments on that. My immediate reaction to that is, we found ourselves becoming morons. Follow the program. Got to get David Hula's world record. And it's a, I'm not shooting them down, but you can get sucked into that vortex to hell that I said. And you can follow a program and just in case, just in case, we're going to spray this, we're going to spray that. And we found ourselves going that route and finding, like, for example, the increase of red spider mite. Suddenly now you've got to spray a more expensive chemical to control the spider mite. So the old adage of if you're targeting one pest, you're potentially spraying 1,700 other beneficial or neutral insects. And so we pulled back on that. And for at least two seasons now, we've seen the results. We, we've not, having, not had to spray for red spider mite again. So you can get sucked in. And I'm saying as the, mo the more you get into this regenerative agriculture and the, how it, it excites you, the more you're going to learn to look for better alternatives. Klaus? Now, I think it's, it's really going out and measuring. Because, I mean, at the end, if you, if you use... Um, um, integrated technologies, you need to have the eyes for what you do. So if we look into the citrus orchards that we're having in Hrobrosdal at the moment and we're losing uh, modern technology, you can see a lot of beneficials on there. You know, you see predatory mites, you see, you know, whole ecosystems coming back into these orchards. You need to know what you're doing, that's why I'm saying. So um, you have monocrops, you have a citrus orchard, you can't have diversity of different, you know, flower pasture there. It's a, it's a citrus orchard, but within that orchard you find so many beneficials going in there. And that's why it's so important to see whenever you do an intervention, it's not just to spray, but to actually see what's the threshold level that you do in order to apply the right technology that doesn't interfere with that harmony. To, to an extent that we can afford or where it's justified at the end of the day, correct? So it's really finding that balance, it's, it's um, where we're going after. And research plays a massive important role in that. Research and I think the one virtue that farmers have is the eyes, is looking at what's happening in that orchard, in that tree, in that field, in that is really looking at it, driving your farm and having an eye on what you do. And, because and it tells you a lot. And, and I have the view of a generation to come. Yep. It's, it's, it's a long-term thing. Would you like to add anything, Quivers? Yeah, I think we must just, in terms of rewilding, the question is, is what is the impact of the spraying in an orchard versus the, let's say, if there's insect populations going down, does that, what is the cause and effect? So from a, from a, a company perspective, we do a lot of research, for example, on bees and, and, and these kind of pests that are actually in the orchards so that we know the products that we use either do not affect them or that we can use them in certain time frames where they're not present. So that I think is what from a company perspective is already being done and monitoring and making sure that we use the pesticides just when we really need them. I think that is from a crop life perspective also what we promote and keep on promoting is that we put pr those programs together. So I think from a cause and effect point of view we first need to figure that out um, because it, don't necessarily mean that if insect population is going down it's because of crop, the use of crop protection products, there could be many other causes that, that, that uh, cause that. But uh, for us, definitely a key focus is to be, like we said, more targeted, making sure that we only target the, the, <coughs> the, uh, the problem species and that we don't have an, or the least possible effect on beneficial species or other species that are in that. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes you might be taking a decision you want to use a biological, correct? So now you believe the world is okay again. We had to take out some of our biologicals of our research cascade because they were too toxic to human beings. So you had to take, you had to reverse them. You had to take them out, correct? So again, on biologicals, if you have biologicals that have an effect on an insect, you need to be knowing what they do, correct? So they might have a different level of activity but they will interfere also because that's why, you, that's why you use them. But they have a different, a different justification to be used. And I think that's the balance that Kubas is just trying to find that right balance and actually start managing your orchard. Mm -hmm. Still coming back to 
to the pharma needs to apply it. You know, it the needs to be needs profitable. To be there, it needs yeah. to be sustainable. Yeah. And in this instance, it needs to be in line with consumers and, and specifically retailers in, in overseas Otherwise, markets. Otherwise, they're not going to buy it. They're not going to buy it, yeah. I think just adding to Klaus, perhaps, uh, for, for a start, organic and biological doesn't necessarily equate safe. Um, and I think that's something that we need to realize. So, so, so if we make that mind shift as well, um, I think we're much better off. I think the value of, of GMOs, we, shouldn't, we, we, we should also not downplay that. Um, the, the new technology that's available um, makes that you spray a lot less pesticides. Um, and if the moment you does that, it's target specific. So, so, so the, the, the specific worm that eats the soybean plant or that eats the maize plants, that's the only thing that you target. The rest is still there and is still around there. So um, GMO is a, is, is a bad word out there, but it, it makes us, us a lot safer in terms of the amount of chemicals that we use in our crops as and well. And it has been the fundament of the last 20 years of, of no tillage systems or low tillage system that brings back organics into the soil that helps your water management preserve your soil moisture that's the fundament of a lot of successful farming in south africa and specifically in the area where we are here in, in the free state it's because of those developments yeah because of gmo and the, the ability of course to go into into lower no tillage systems Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Yolandi, thank you for your question. Um, I think it added another, another, another um, element to the discussion, so thank you very much. Um, and I just want to end up with thanking my, my panel, Kubus, Egon, Jaku, Klaus. Thank you very much, guys. I think this is a very important topic, and I think part of the success of, the, of getting the message across is to have these discussions and try to, 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 to wash out where the, where the issues are, what should be educational, what should be promoted, and also on the other side to keep all the role players um, in line. As you said, keep them honest, keep them, uh, keep them balanced, and I think that is an important segment of this. So from my point of view, thank you for attending, thank you to Bia and to my panel, thank you very much. I enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.